my friends, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. I'm doing great. I am super excited today because we get to go visit the grave of one of my favorite people. When I was learning guitar, I used to watch B.B. King as often as I could on anything I could find because he just made playing guitar look super easy. It was so inspiring. I heard The Thrill Is Gone, I loved that song, but when I heard Hummingbird, I was sold forever. I got to see him perform one time at the uh, famed Hollywood Bowl with George Thorogood. It was an amazing show. Unfortunately, I never got to meet him, never got to get his autograph or anything, but today we're going to go to Indianola, the, uh, where B.B. King used to call his hometown. But we're gonna make a stop along the way because he was actually born somewhere before there. Um, we're going to the birthplace of B.B. King and then we are gonna to go to his museum and his gravesite. So, hope you enjoy this. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. Jai, you're gonna to have to look a little more spry than that today, man. We're doing some vlogging on B.B. King, baby. The great Riley King. The king of the blues. Man, this is sad to see. The sign, and we are out here like in the middle of nowhere. The sign has been completely knocked off. It's completely broken. I mean, you can read it and everything, but look, it's broken off there. The birthplace of B.B. King. The long and remarkable life of B.B. King began near this site where he was born Riley B. King on September 16th. 1925, his parents Albert and Nora Ella King were sharecroppers who lived in a simple home southeast of here along the Bear Creek. After his parents separated when he was four, King lived in Kilmichael and Lexington before moving as a teen to Indianola, which he referred to as his hometown. I think the Bear Creek is right down there. Yeah, his mother left his father and he was raised by his grandmother started singing in the choir at church. So here it says, B.B. King's birthplace, ambassador of the blues and king of the blues, as titled Riley, B.B. King earned as the result of decades of touring around the world, but the life of King, who is probably the most influential musician in the history of the blues, could not have begun more humbly. His early years were spent as a sharecropper's cabin, a little more than a half mile southeast of this marker. So it's showing here where we are and where the homestead would have been. Must be on somebody's property. BB's father, Albert, looks just like him. Good grief. There's BB at 17. He got his first guitar from his mother's cousin when he was 15. The uh, yeah, of course there was segregation then, so it says. The public facilities were segregated during BB's childhood in Mississippi. The door is shown in the photo of the Bertrand Chair Station from the 1920s is marked colored. And then down here, it's got a picture and it says BB visiting his birthplace in 2007. First time that he'd been here since he was a small child, he located the spot with the help of directions given by his father to BB's biographer Charles Sawyer and captured on audio tape. He stands next to a Farmall tractor that was very much like the one he drove in the early 40s. Wow. Everybody wants to know why I sing the blues? Yes, I say, everybody want to know. So he actually got his, a lot of his start in Memphis. He went and he was on the radio and he was performing in Memphis and became known as the Beale Street Blues Boy, and then they shortened it to Blues Boy, then BB. And also says, in the late 40s, King moved to Memphis to pursue a musical career. By 1949, he had found work as a DJ on radio station WDIA, in addition to winning talent contests at the Palace Theater. At WDIA, he earned the nickname BB, short for Blues Boy. He, his career took off in 1952 
with his first number one rhythm and blues hit, Three O'Clock Blues. Over the next decade, he scored dozens of hits on the RPM, Kent, ABC, Bluesway, and MCA labels. He toured relentlessly, performing over 350 one-night stands one year. Until the 1960s, the vast majority of King's fans were African-American, but by the end of the decade, young whites had embraced his music. His guitar playing had served as a model for countless blues rock and rhythm blues musicians. So cool to see. Said his 1970 crossover hit, The Thrill Is Gone, provided him with the first of a dozen Grammys with a launching point for international stardom. Among his many subsequent recordings were collaborations with artists across the musical spectrum, including Willie Nelson, U2, Eric Clapton, Pavarotti, and Heavy D. All the while, King never forgot the folks back home, and in the 1960s began making regular visits back to Mississippi for events, including annual celebration in honor of slain civil rights leader Medgar Evers, and later B.B. King's homecoming celebration in Indianola and workshops with students at the Mississippi Valley State University. 2004, the school created the B.B. King Recording Studio in his honor, and in 2008, Mississippi honored its favorite son by opening the B.B. King Museum and Delta Interpretive Center in Indianola, which we will go to now. And I'm gonna leave that the best way I can, the best way I found it. Maybe we'll get lucky and someone at the museum will be able to tell me if the church that he went to is still around. I know the name of it, but it's not popping up on maps anywhere, so maybe it's changed names since then. I asked for back roads, baby, and I got them. Golly. Feel like I should be on a horse and buggy. Okay, good, here we go. Sign for Indianola, seven miles. Right off to the side of the road, I saw this sign. Smiling BB King, Lucille is talking at the BB King Museum. Follow the signs. I'm kind of excited to see how elaborate his final resting place is. I haven't seen this in any photos or anything yet. Oh, this is incredible. I'm so happy to be here. This place looks really big, actually. I know he's buried on the grounds here. When he passed away, he um, his body was taken in the hearse down Beale Street with a parade and everything going past all of his old haunts. And then they brought him down here and he lied in repose here for fans to come and see his open casket. Then he was also buried here. There's statue of Lucille, his beloved guitar. Story to that was he was performing a show one night and a fight broke out and place caught on fire and uh, he almost lost his guitar and the next day he found out that the uh, the guys were fighting over a woman named Lucille so he named his guitar that so that he would remember to never forget it again and look here on the other side of the guitar they have all kinds of historical stuff like Club Ebony where he used to play all the time Three o'clock blues over here. So that was his first hit. The thrill is gone. That's like a crossover hit. WDIA. That's where he was on the radio. There he is jamming. Old sourpuss. He said that's what one of his wives used to call him, nickname him. Because the faces he would make. Looks like it must have been the old train depot, huh? You even get to listen to his music when you come in. So I was wrong, that was not the train station. This is actually the cotton gin that BB worked in. They made this part of the museum. Now the downside is we're not allowed to show you any of the exhibit stuff in here. They won't let me show you any of his clothes or guitars or anything like that. But I can show you the, uh, the cotton gin where he worked, which is in here. And I can also show you his gravesite. But this is interesting because this was 
one of the first jobs that he had. And this is how he ended up making the $15 that allowed him to buy his first guitar. He was working at a really early age. And he got into guitar because he was really into, you know, he's singing in the choir in church and he loved going to church. And um, the preacher there had like a silver tone guitar. So BB got his first guitar after seeing that. And that guy was the one that originally taught him how to play. Now, this is also really significant because this is the room that they had BB's body in after he passed away for the fans to come and pay their respects. So, real bummer that I can't show you, you know, the artifacts in the museum. I will tell you what I saw, but I'll show you what they allow me to show you. So the inside was pretty interesting. Um, I would say probably 70% of it was the history of Delta music, how it was made, the lifestyle, things like that, not directly related to B.B. King, but then the stuff that was related to B.B. King was pretty cool. They had the um, jacket and outfit and things and the guitar that he played when he, at one of the Medgar Evers festivals that he came back for. They actually had his personal recording studio office in there, which was really cool because it had a recording studio in there, his uh, computer that he would search the internet on, a lot of cool figures of like Dean Martin, James Brown, um, who else was in there? I think Stan Laurel, big cool figures. Um, and then he had framed on the wall a couple of, it was like a hundred dollar bill and a couple of sets of playing cards on either side. And I could, I looked over really close and I noticed that one was three tens and it said edge underneath. And then it was three aces and it said BB King underneath. So it must have been playing cards with you two's the edge and him framing his winning hand. So it was really cool to look at all of his personal belongings in there. They had one of his guitars that he would use when he would record in there. Um, probably three or four different suit jackets or things that he wore during performances. Um, talked about a family that when he first started sharecropping, he had actually had to, he grew up in Kill Michael with his grandmother. To get there, he had to ride his bike 50 miles. And once he got there, a white family took him in and they gave him a place to sleep and gave him food and gave him a job. And so they had some of the uh, dishes and things like that from that family's house in there on display. And they also talked about how when BB was playing in New York, he loved to go bowling and like, most times he was there when he was done with a gig at like two in the morning, he would find this one bowling alley and go play, go bowl for an, for like four or five hours till like eight in the morning and then go to the hotel and sleep afterward. So now um, I would say go definitely check out the museum. It's got a lot of really cool artifacts, but now we're going to go check out his final resting place out here. The way the museum is laid out inside is very similar to um, Elvis's birthplace in Tupelo, the way they have that museum inside there, if you've ever been there. This is great. I already see a statue of BB sitting on a bench out here. And if you want to see, I believe online on their website, they have photos of his office. That was, the, in my opinion, the best thing worth seeing here. So you can actually see that on online for free. BB King bronze statue, life size, presented to the museum by the family of John William McPherson. That is great. What a career. His ring says 88. Got the guitar on the lapel even up here. That's so cool. What a great statue. Now he was married twice, but it was really early in his career and both of the marriages didn't last very long because he said it's hard to keep a marriage together when you're touring 365 days a year. And that, that in a lot of cases wasn't, what wasn't even uh, exaggerating. <laughs> he did, so 
here's the crazy thing. I believe he did try and have kids with one of his wife, one of his wives, and uh, they found out that he had a low sperm count. But he ended up, during his lifetime, they said that he fathered 15 kids. Now you wonder, how the heck? Well, apparently, anytime somebody accused him, he never fought it. He just paid him. Like, he just paid for their living and established a college fund and everything. So, in a way, you almost think the guy was working so much because he loved it that he almost probably was just looking at it like, hey, I got the money. If they need, people need the money this bad that they're going to say this, then whatever. And apparently he would have relationships with the kids too, from what I understand. So it's got some song lyrics. It's got his real name, Riley B. King. Don't know why I was made to wander. I've seen the light, Lord. I felt the thunder. Someday I'll go home again, and I know they'll take me in and take it home. Lyrics from the song, Take It Home, from his 1979 album. Now they kind of built a room around this where he's buried, and those are all song titles. Now here's what's crazy. When he passed away, I told you, 15 kids, three more came out and said that he was the father. And then apparently his family came out and claimed that his business manager poisoned him. Because BB was, he was diabetic. They found out in the early 90s he was diabetic. So he had like a private chef and everything that traveled with him so that he could eat healthy. And yeah, they claimed that he had been poisoned. That's how he died. But during the autopsy, there was no, no findings of any poison or anything like that. So I believe the business manager ended up suing the family. You know, it's rare that people that, you know, idolize somebody like BB King would, would all like them for the same thing, but it's kind of crazy when you hear guitarists that were influenced by him, people like Keith Richards and Eric Clapton, they all say the same thing. It doesn't matter if you solo with BB King, it doesn't matter what you do. He will win because he you can play a million notes and he will play one note and he'll beat you because the beauty and the magic of BB King is in the vibrato of his fingers and those slow bends and just holding out sustaining long notes and uh, it just was such an emotional feeling when you heard BB King play. One of the reasons I think he had a lot more success than people before him was that before him, a lot of the blues musicians were strictly just playing blues joints, but he was, people were, you know, like the rock and rollers were talking about how they were inspired by blues musicians. So people like B.B. King were some of the first ones to book themselves or get booked in rock and roll slash blues clubs. So it was a bigger audience. If you're new to B.B. King, go for the thrill is gone. Listen to that one first, but I, uh, my personal favorite's Hummingbird. That's crazy. For some reason, I thought that was an 88. Of course, his ring is a BB. The heck? I was thinking of the song Rocket 88, so I was like, oh, maybe there's a connection there. There's the outside of the cotton gin that he worked in that we walked through. BB, it's been an honor. And if you're looking for just an absolutely killer photo op on your way out, right there with the king, as the king. So our next stop's just literally a minute away, like two blocks away. Okay, that's probably more like a five minute walk because it's two really long blocks. So take a look at this. They have an old picture of BB over here. Kind of an advertisement for WDIA at 5.30 p.m. It says BB's favorite corner. It was on this corner when B.B. was just a young man of 17 that locals first heard the musician destined to become the king of the blues. On June 6, 1980, B.B. King placed his handprints and signature in the walk. How crazy that all started right there. If you walk over here, you can see there's a guitar that says B.B. King Lucille. 
and even like a, an RIP headstone. But right over here, he put Riley BB King. You can see his hand prints are right there, his footprints are right there. And it was June 5th, 1980. And then the picture says, on my corner, both the blacks and whites would see me. It wasn't something I planned. It was just like a good fishing place. Seemed like a nice spot to be. You'd find me on the corner on Saturdays and sometimes after I got off work. I never passed the hat, but the people knew that I'd appreciate a dime if I played a tune they requested. So he played right there, just sitting right there with his guitar. Now from this corner, we're gonna walk right down there. There's another placard here. They also have a plaque here to Albert King, which it's kind of weird because it says he was billed as King of the Blues guitar, famed for his powerful string bending style as well as his soulful smoky vocals. King often said he was born in Indianola and was the half brother of BB King, although the scant surviving official documentation suggests otherwise to both counts. Carved his own indelible niche in the blues hierarchy by creating a deep dramatic sound that was widely imitated by both blues and rock guitars. So why is it here if he wasn't really <laughs> BB's half brother and he wasn't from here? I'm not sure why it's on this corner. I hope you guys had as much fun as I did today. Getting to see BB King's birthplace, even if it's just a sign, getting to see where his final resting place, and even cooler where he first started performing and making money. I had a blast. I, you know, you never hear any bad stories about B.B. King. He was always one of the good guys in blues. So this was so much fun to get to check out all these locations and I hope you enjoyed him as well. Mm -hmm.